Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Welcome you to join Bible Race to read the entire Bible in two years. I believe God will bless you, He will lift you up, and your life will never be the same. The Book of 1 Samuel Chapter 9 Saul Chosen to be King There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becheroth, son of Aphia, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul his son, Take one of the young men with you and arise, go and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. And they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to a servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in the city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer, for today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they met young women coming out to draw water and said to them, Is a seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he is just ahead of you. Hurry, he has come just now to the city, because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him, before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people of Israel. People Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Then Samuel took Saul and his young man and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about thirty persons. And Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, of which I told you, I said to you, put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, See, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may, I may make known to you the word of God. The Book of 1 Samuel, Chapter 10 Saul Anointed King then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of, your, of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of ben Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say to you, The donkeys that you went to seek are found, and now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? And you, then you shall go on from there farther and come to the Oak of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. 
and they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that you shall come to Gabith Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them prophesying. Then the Spirit of God will rush upon you, and you will, you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for the God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and, a, and the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And the man of the place answered, And who was their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? And he said, To seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were not to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. And Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys had been found, but about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoke, spoken, he did not tell him anything. Saul proclaimed king. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mitzpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was taken by Lot, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king! Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of the kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid, them up, laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some worthless fellow said, How can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present. But he held his peace. Amen. The following is the English translation of Pastor Martino Huang's teaching on the book of First Samuel, chapters 9-10. to Translated by Bryson. Read the Bible every day so you'll be full of faith. Let's take a look at First Samuel, chapters 9-10. to Chapter 10 describes how Saul was chosen to be king. In chapter 9, verse 1, there was a man from Benjamin named Kish, a mighty warrior. The term mighty warrior in the original text can mean a powerful warrior, a wealthy man, or someone of high status. In verse 2, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. In the ancient Middle Eastern nations, the physical appearance and stature of the king were highly valued. A tall and imposing king would make the people proud. If you look at the sculptures from that time, you can see the beauty standards of that era. Saul came from a good family. He was strong and handsome, tall, and he was also dutiful, humble, and courteous. By the standards of other nations, no one was more suitable to be king than Saul. Therefore, God chose Saul as king to show the people what would happen when the most ideal king by human standards gained power. Saul was almost the best choice from a human perspective. In verses 3-5, to five, we see that Saul's father, Kish, lost some donkeys and asked his son to search for them. So Saul went to the land of Zeph, which was Samuel's hometown. Ramathayam Zophim, also known as Rama. This shows that Saul was quite dutiful as he went to great lengths to search for his father's lost donkeys. He was obedient and loyal, fitting the people's expectations of a leader. In verses 6 to 10, while searching for the donkeys, Saul's servants suggested consulting a seer, a man of God, whose words always came true. They thought it would be quicker to ask him since they couldn't find the donkeys. Saul asked what they could bring as a gift. And the servant said he had a quarter of a shekel of silver. 
about a week's wages for a servant at that time. From this interaction, it, was, it is apparent that Saul did not seem to know Samuel well. Even though Samuel was a judge, indicating that Saul was not very concerned with the judges or current events, and was simply a simple farmer at home. In verses 11 to 14, they encountered some young women coming out to draw water. In the past, drawing water was mostly done by women, usually near the evening, indicating that it was evening at that time. They asked the women where they could find the seer. The seer is another term for a prophet. The woman directed them to the high place, where seers typically offered sacrifices. Previously, we mentioned that after Shiloh was destroyed, Samuel had been offering sacrifices at the high place in Ramah. Verses 15 to 17 revealed that the day before Saul's arrival, God had already spoken to Samuel, telling him, Tomorrow about this time I will send to you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people, because their cry has come to me. This shows that even before everything happened, God was already in control and had informed Samuel of his plans. God made it clear that Saul was chosen to govern his people, indicating that the Israelites belonged to God, not to a king. They were God's people and not the private property of any monarch. God was only entrusting Saul to help manage his people. So God wanted Samuel to anoint Saul. In the Old Testament, only three types of roles required anointing, priests, kings, and prophets. Anointing involved pouring oil on the person's head to consecrate them to God for a special mission. Saul's mission, as stated by God, was to save his people from the Philistines and to govern them. In verses 18-19, to 19, Saul approached Samuel and asked for the seer was. Samuel responded by revealing that he was the seer. So you have to see, God arranges all these quote-unquote coincidences. They were planned beforehand. Dear family, if it is God's will, you have to well realize that God will always prepare and make a way for you. We don't have to be rushed and be worried and put so much effort to, for example, get money, open, open the way, thinking about all the possible solutions. Next, Samuel told Saul, As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? This sort of statement can really surprise or even terrify some people. All of Israel is, is desiring me and all of my father's house? So Saul immediately replied, Am I not a Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Here Saul seems very humble because he truly recognizes his status. Indeed, he belongs to the smallest tribe of Israel, the Benjamites. This has historical significance. If you look back at Judges chapters 19-21, to it tells a story about Levi and his concubine. They stayed in the house of a man in Gibeah. Some wicked men of the city came and took the concubine, abused her, and she died from the mistreatment. The Levite then cut her body into 12 pieces and sent them throughout Israel's territory. The Israelites united as one to punish the people of Gibeah for this atrocity, demanding that ben the Benjamites hand over the perpetrators. Gibeah was a city in Benjamin, and the Benjamites refused. This refusal led the Israelites to gather their forces to fight against Gibeah and the tribe of Benjamin. In the end, God gave the Israelites victory. Judges 20 verse 46 records that 25,000 Benjamite warriors fell that day. Only 600 men survived and fled to the wilderness. Then after that, the Israelites regretted their actions against their brothers, the Benjamites, and they feared the complete destruction of one of the Israelites' tribes. This near annihilation left the tribe of Benjamin significantly diminished. This history explains why Saul said he was from the smallest tribe of Israel, the Benjamites who had been almost wiped out. Additionally, Gibeah as Saul's home was infamous, further emphasizing his lowly status. Saul felt it was inconceivable that he could be the one whom all Israel looked to with hope and expectation. Then in verse 22, Samuel took Saul and his servant into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who were invited, about 30 persons. Uh, Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion I gave you, the one I told you to set aside. So the cook took up the leg with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, Here's what has been kept for you. Eat because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said I invited guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. Verses 25 to 26 mention that Samuel spoke with Saul on the roof. In ancient Israel, the roofs were flat, so they could accommodate guests sleeping there. Samuel deliberately spoke with Saul on the roof, likely to show the people in the city how he honored Saul. Later, Samuel brought Saul to the edge of the city, a more private place where he anointed him. In chapter 10, verse 1, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, 
Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people, Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. God emphasized once again that Saul was chosen to govern his people, indicating that the Israelites belonged to God and not to any king. Saul's journey to kingship began unexpectedly as he was initially searching for his father's donkeys, not seeking power or a kingdom. Saul was a farmer from Gibeah and these, the people of Gibeah were often looked down upon. This demonstrates how God chooses the humble and the despised and also you don't have anything to lead, so no one may boast before him. Unfortunately, as we will see, Saul did not fully seize the opportunity given to him. In verses 2-8, to eight, since Saul had no aspirations to be king and felt unworthy, Samuel tells him of three signs that are confirmed God's choice and presence with, with him. The first sign mentioned in verse 2 was that Saul's donkeys would be found, marking the end of his old responsibilities and the beginning of a new calling. The second sign in verse 4 involves receiving two loaves of bread. The Septuagint adds that these loaves were sacrificial bread, indicating Saul's consecration and the right to partake in priestly offerings after his anointing. The third sign in verses 5-6 to six was encountering a group of prophets with the Spirit of God coming upon Saul, enabling him to prophesy and be transformed into a new man. Verse 7, Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. God's Spirit moved on Saul, which is what we call today as being filled by the Holy Spirit. And he spoke what the Lord told him to say and prophesied. In verse 9, God gave Saul a new heart and all the signs were fulfilled that day. The transformation was so significant that in verse 10, And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? Indeed, God knew Saul's humility. God gave him three cents to confirm that he had truly chosen Saul and he would, he would be with him. Moreover, God's spirit greatly filled him and deeply moved him. Through this, God gave Saul a new heart, showing that God intended to transform him into another person, preparing him to undertake the new mission God has assigned him to govern God's people, the Israelites. Dear family, when God chooses, he equips and anoints. Therefore, we should not fear thinking we are inadequate or incapable of what God calls us to do. If we shrink back and do not obey, we will miss out. If we are willing and step forward like Saul did, God can immediately fill us with his spirit, empowering us to fulfill his purposes. Saul became prophesying because God knew he was ready to take on his new assignment. God began speaking to him, imparting him the gift of prophecy so that he could be moved, speak God's words, and also be transformed, becoming a new person who was able to accept God's mission for him. Everything is the work of God. When God calls, he equips. Additionally, we see the work of the Spirit in Saul, and I encourage all of us to continually seek to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is the fastest way to change our hearts, thoughts, and emotions. You transform our entire being into a new person. Therefore, being filled with the Spirit is not just a one-time thing, one, not just a one-time experience, but something we should continually seek through worship, prayer, and a deeper relationship with the Lord. What we should say to the Lord, I desire more, I thirst to be continually renewed and transformed. In verses 14 to 16, Saul's uncle comes to him and asks, What did Samuel say to you? Saul replied to his uncle, saying that the donkeys have been found, but he did not reveal anything else. From this, we can see that Saul was a very cautious person who did not speak without careful consideration. I believe within himself, Saul still felt unworthy of the new position. He must have been overwhelmed by the sudden and unexpected development of events. In verse 17, now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Samuel gathers them at Mizpah, which is a significant place within Benjamin's territory. Mizpah had been the site where some years ago in Judges 20, Israel had gathered to get, plan a military at actions against Benjamin. Now they gather here once again, but this time Samuel is going to anoint a king here. The interesting thing is that the first time was to fight against people of Gibeah, and the second time we are now anointing a person of Gibeah to be king. 
Verse 20 to 21 is also interesting. Samuel starts the process by casting lots. The tribe of Benjamin is chosen, followed by the family of the Matrites, and then finally Saul, son of Kish, is chosen. But when they saw him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the peoples. And all the people shouted, Long live the king! The people are excited because Saul appears impressive. Tall, handsome, and from a wealthy and respected family, he seems to be everything they want in a king. They cheer enthusiastically, wanting him to reign as their king. It's notable that in Israel's history, leaders like Moses, Joshua, and the judges were not through drawing lots, but they were appointed directly by God. But because the people requested for a king, what the people want, so even the way Saul is chosen to be king, is different from before. Samuel then explains the rights and duties of the kingship to the people, establishing the laws and expectations for the new monarch. Samuel returns home to Gibeah accompanied by a group of men of valor, whom God has stirred to follow him. Despite Saul's initial reluctance and lack of confidence, God provides him with a loyal army to support him, a sign of God's understanding and provision, even in circumstances that are not in line with his ideal plan. In verse 27, the method of selecting Saul through human methods inevitably leads some to question how he could possibly even save him. David despised him and did not bring him gifts. However, Saul paid no attention to this. Dear family, if this is not your first time reading 1 Samuel, and if you are familiar with the historical accounts in the Bible, you know that later on Saul departs so far from God's heart that it became outrageous. Saul symbolizes a king of the flesh, ruling according to human nature. Though he initially appeared humble, once seated on the throne, he became attached to his power and authority. Looking back on history, we can see that Saul's initial humility stemmed more from a sense of lowly birth rather than true humility. But true humility is a complete reliance on and submission to God. Saul's early humility was superficial because it was rooted in a sense of inferiority due to his background. When he gained wealth, power, and the throne, he sought to control everything. When Saul perceived David as a threat to his kingship, he acted irrationally. Why? His true reliance was not on God, but on the blessings of God, his position, authority, power, and honor. God chose Saul, a humble man, giving him an opportunity to bring about a transformation for the whole nation. However, Saul did not seize this opportunity to fully rely on God. Instead, when he ascended to the throne, he asserted his authority and possession over everything as if he were the true king. He didn't realize that it was God entrusting Saul to govern his people. Dear family, sometimes when God elevates us in various spheres of life, whether in the workplace or elsewhere, to govern his people and his property, this is a mission, a responsibility, and a calling from God. He will fill us, exalt us, and grant us gifts in this regard. But let us ask the Lord for help not to think that we are truly lords and kings, forgetting that only Yahweh is God, only he is king. Let's ask the Lord to help us so we do not forget the God who gives us grace, especially when we are elevated by Him. Let us have a humble heart from beginning to end, closely relying on God and letting God be the true King. Amen. Dear Bible Race viewers and families in Christ, thank you for watching our videos. We hope our sharing can enrich your life. If you find the content helpful, we hope you will support our ministry so we may continue to produce high-quality videos to serve the kingdom of God and hope to bless more people's lives. You can donate in the following ways. Online giving by PayPal. If you are residing in Taiwan, you may also donate by bank transfer. Thanks again for your viewing and support. Every contribution is our greatest encouragement. We sincerely appreciate your support. May God bless you abundantly. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Dear families, we hope that you enjoy the Bible race as much as we do. If you are willing to volunteer to translate the original Chinese teaching into English or assist with video editing, please email service at 360sunrise.com. Thank you.